Energy efficiency is invisible, and yet it is the most potent force that exists for uh, reducing CO2 emissions, reducing energy demand, and improving energy productivity. Uh, energy has grown substantially slower than the economy in the U.S. Uh, that has enormously benefited uh, the people in the country, saved probably uh, uh, close to a trillion dollars a year. Uh, if it weren't for that, we'd be paying, tw we'd be using twice as much energy. If we had kept up the rate at which we were doing electricity, uh, the rate at which electricity was growing in 1973, five percent a year, we would today be such that Every eight miles between the Mexican border and San Francisco, there would be a nuclear power plant. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. In fact, there are two instead of 400. One question I often get is, well, how much energy can we actually save with these energy efficiency programs? And the answer really is, it's a, a question of how much you're willing to actually put into it. You get out what you put in. It takes significant investment uh, both in policy and in money to make this happen. But leading jurisdictions are now saving on the electricity side, for example, as much as two and a half or three percent per year. So if you space that out over a 10 year investment period, you're talking about getting 25 to 30 percent of your electricity needs through an energy efficiency program. So I'm sometimes asked, why do we need policies and programs to promote efficiency in the first place? Wouldn't, in a well-structured, uh, free economy, those investments in efficiency that made sense happen on their own accord? Wouldn't consumers make the right choices? Well, there's a number of reasons why they don't, uh, things don't work that way. Uh, for, for starters, at the, at the highest level, uh, as much as I'm a believer in the free market, I'm a, an economist by training, um, anyone who uh, has that training understands that no markets are perfect. Uh, the, the, the perfect market may be something we all strive for, but it doesn't exist today. And there's a whole variety of reasons uh, for that, um, most, most of which uh, kind of get lumped under um, a term called market barriers, things about the market that don't work the way we would otherwise like them to. For starters, um, uh, the, 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 all of the economic theory behind free markets presumes that consumers have perfect information about every choice they're making. We know today, uh, for that matter, we've always known that that's just not possible. Um, so there's, there are information barriers. Consumers are unaware of the benefits of some of the efficiency measures they, in which they could be investing. In many cases, manufacturers and the retailers who are selling products and builders who are constructing buildings and contractors who are installing heating and cooling systems are themselves unaware of the efficiency opportunities, uh, not just in the equipment that they're selling and installing, but in some cases even in how to sell, install, or build something correctly. In terms of factors that, that um, could make energy efficiency programs successful, uh, it depends a lot on the nature of the program. Um, in many ways, the most important types of programs are national policies that are implemented. Let me give you an example. Appliance efficiency standards. While there was a lot of opposition to it because people said that the market would bring more efficient appliances 
uh, into play if, if, if they really were cost effective. The reality is that that didn't happen and that standards, for example, on refrigerators uh, reduce the typical electricity consumption of a refrigerator uh, to 20 percent of its value prior to the standards. And this is in a period of uh, maybe 10 years. Uh, it was argued that refrigerators would become terribly expensive if you did that. Uh, the data show that refrigerators have continued to drop in price while adding features, while becoming dramatically more efficient. Uh, so national policy makes a huge, very, very large difference. There are other factors and other kinds of programs. For example, utility programs uh, have been very successful. They're called demand-side management. And they're especially effective uh, in tailoring energy efficiency for local uses because they're dealing with the customer directly. Uh, building energy efficiency standards have been very successful in those states that have adopted strong standards and have enforced them. On the other hand, if you don't enforce the standards, uh, you don't get anything. And if you don't have trained people and paid trained people to enforce the standards, you don't get anything. Those are obvious statements, but sadly, uh, many states do not enforce standards in any significant way. Okay, so if you've reached the point at least uh, at, at some kind of macro level that it makes sense to at least consider efficiency, now what should you do about it? Well, in the jurisdictions that have pursued this, they've, they've looked at this question, um, and sometimes different market actors, uh, different policymakers, have made the decisions to, to pursue uh, a course of action that would lead to greater investment in efficiency. Sometimes it's legislatures that have taken the first act. And those acts can, can take several forms. Um, for one thing, you can develop uh, codes and standards. Um, a code might uh, prescribe the minimum efficiency requirements that any builder must use before constructing a new home or a new commercial building. That's completely outside of the regulatory context and uh, I think it makes a whole lot of sense as long as you're going to actually effectively enforce those codes to invest as much effort on the policy arena at, in those kinds of codes and standards as you possibly can because it eliminates a whole variety of other transactions that you have to try to influence along the way. If you can require a manufacturer to only sell products that meet a certain efficiency standard for, say, refrigerators, you no longer have to influence millions of consumers. You just have to influence a very small number of manufacturers. And in fact, you don't even have to influence them. You're actually dictating to them. So that's a, that's a, a much simpler and, in many cases, much cheaper path to go. So one key policy initiative that can be particularly important, uh, has proved to be important in a number of jurisdictions in North America, is what is called decoupling. And that is uh, regulations that are established so that the electric or gas utilities' profits are not based on how much electricity or gas they sell. Rather, it is based on uh, an overall assessment of their performance in delivering energy service at a, a good cost to their consumers. An energy service can come in the form of both electricity in terms of gas and in the form of efficiency investments. Energy efficiency is not going to happen just by chance. You have to create policies that support it. You have to start internalizing the externalities, reduce the subsidies, the hidden subsidies and the overt subsidies to uh, the supply side so that the energy efficiency side has a, at least a level playing field. If you're really interested in promoting it among private actors, you should make uh, it possible for private actors to make more money out of saving energy than out of um, supplying more energy as a way of also internalizing the externalities. Um, and what's really nice is that the world is moving in that direction regardless. Electricity tariffs are, are quite important to send the right signal um, so that people use energy more carefully. We've done a wonderful job over the last 100 plus years of electricity to make it invisible for most customers and to offer it at a cost that's quite low uh, and also avoid sending a signal to people when the cost is actually very high to procure.
But if you have a low tariff, people will use too much energy because there are alternative um, uses for the money and they will not invest as much in energy efficiency. But the tariff is not the only thing you need to make energy efficiency happen. It's just that traditionally the tariff, if anything, is too low to make people pay the sufficient attention to energy efficiency. Uh, in terms of very energy intensive industries like aluminum, uh, these tend to locate in places of low electricity cost. This is an industry that's very intensive in electricity use and therefore it typically l locates close to a hydropower plant. Um, and without that low cost electricity, it would simply look for a different place to locate. So tariffs that try to bring those industries to uh, a certain locale uh, and are willing to subsidize it with low tariffs end up paying in the infrastructure that's necessary to provide that low-cost electricity to something like an aluminum uh, smelter. Um, buildings are pretty darn important in the energy efficiency game. In uh, the United States, as a high, buildings are somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of all uh, energy use, depending on your accounting. Um, in developing countries, uh, the big culprit right now, or the big user, is industry. But uh, air-conditioned buildings are growing all over the world, and so building energy use is the fastest growing component of any developing country. Now, can we afford to do it? Uh, it uh, of course, we define energy efficiency as something which has a payback time, and after you've got your money back, continues to save you money. So energy efficiency is, is a money saver, the question is, can we afford to save money? Well, um, that means we need access to capital, um, which is something that the, a government can provide. Um, or we need to give incentives, which is equivalent to access to capital, uh, so that the payback time is so short, maybe a couple of years, that the uh, building owner sort of can't afford. It's an offer he can't refuse. That's basically what we do in California, is to plow two or three percent of electric revenues and gas revenues back into incentive programs uh, so that uh, cons individual consumers see short payback times and uh, individual buildings owners see short payback times. The last um, uh, key point that I would make is, uh, is again a legislative policy that ought to be pursued and that is to require uh, perhaps at the time of sale that the that any building that is that is being sold meet have the have its efficiency rated on some sort of um, graduated scale so that the consumers who are buying that home or buying that office building understand what it is they're getting not just in terms of the walls and the roof and the features inside, but in terms of the operating efficiency of the premise. Uh, that has uh, been a, a significant obstacle to uh, investment efficiency in many cases, is that the consumers or the tenants of buildings don't know how efficient they are. And so they buy them or they rent them um, and then get stuck with the bills for many years to come. If you have a, a requirement that the efficiency of those buildings be rated before they are either sold or rented so that consumers can make more informed choices, they will make more informed choices.